Thank you, thank you music team for leading us in this powerful session of worship. Thank you brother Suma for also leading us in that powerful session of prayer. Before I begin, I just want to thank the leadership of this church in absentia led by our senior pastor for this opportunity that he has given to me just to share a small devotion with you and also receive their greetings that are away in Mombasa for our retreat. Then secondly, I want to thank you. Please kindly have your seat. I also want to thank you for just coming in this evening service. You are actually the priests, the servants that keep on flaming, fanning the flame of fire on our altar. I want to share a brief devotion that I've entitled Bouncing Back to Take your territory. And bouncing back basically means to return quickly to a normal state or condition after a difficult situation or event. You can be bouncing back from maybe a medical surgery or even bankruptcy. Territory is basically an area under one's authority or jurisdiction. So when we combine the two, basically you are saying that uh, we are coming back from our areas of struggles or difficulties to take again that territory or the area that we had in control that we were supposed to probably take care of or rule over. It is a common practice in our society and it has become almost nationwide or worldwide, that will set New Year's resolution at the beginning of the year. And many times we do that by reflecting on our past performance, whether in projects, in businesses, in career, or even in our spiritual work with God. The purpose is to help us improve and become better people, and also help us now achieve our goals and purpose in life that you have set in future. But many times, again, that will begin well. We'll begin our Bible study, our consistent reading, our fellowships, our prayer, but along the way, we kind of get tired for one reason or the other. It can be internal or external cause. And uh, I can say that nobody is immune to those obstacles. Nobody is immune to obstacles that come along our way. And uh, I want to read a passage from First Kings chapter 19, verse 1 to 18. It talks about, uh, it's a story about the servant of God called Elijah and uh, some of the challenges he went through while he was serving God. I'll commence the reading, chapter 19. King Ahab told his wife Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he had put all the prophets of Baal to death. She sent a message to Elijah. May the God strike me dead if by this time tomorrow I don't do the same thing to you that you did to the prophets. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He took his servant and went to Beersheba in Judah. Leaving the servant there, Elijah walked a whole day into the wilderness. He stopped and sat down in the shade of a tree and wished he would die. It is too much, Lord, he prayed. Take away my life. I might as well be dead. He lay down under the tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and he said, Wake up and eat. He looked round and saw a loaf of bread and a jar of water near his head. He ate and drank and lay down again. The Lord's angel returned and woke him up a second time, saying, Get up and eat, or the journey will be too much for you. 
Elijah got up, ate, and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to walk 40 days to Sinai, the holy mountain. There he went into a cave to spend the night. Suddenly the Lord spoke to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? He answered, Lord God Almighty, I have always served you, you alone, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed all your prophets. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. Go out and stand before me on top of the mountain, the Lord said to him. Then the Lord passed by and sent a furious wind that split the hills and shattered the rocks. But the Lord was not in the wind. The wind stopped blowing, and then there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the soft whisper of a voice. When Elijah heard it, he covered his face with his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. A voice said to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? He answered, Lord God Almighty, I have always served you, you alone. But the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed all your prophets. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. The Lord said, Return to the wilderness near Damascus. Then enter the city and anoint Hazael as king of Syria. Anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king of Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mehola, to succeed you as prophet. Anyone who escapes me, escapes being put to death by Hazael, will be killed by Jehu, and anyone who escapes Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I will leave 7,000 people alive in Israel, all those who are loyal to me and have not bowed to Baal or kissed his idol. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, we just want to thank you for this another opportunity that you've given unto us to congregate here, to share your word, to encourage each other, to pray and just to glorify your name. That may you minister to us, O oh Lord. May your word, O oh Lord, strengthen us, O oh Lord, and, and encourage us, O oh Lord, in our seasons of difficulties. And even as you use me as a minister in this particular evening, I pray, your oh Father, that may I also be seated down in my spirit just to listen, O oh Lord, to what you have to say to the body of Christ. This I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So the Bible introduces Ahab in chapter 16 as one of the wicked kings that did wicked things that were worse much more than the kings that lived or ruled before him. And to add, to make it worse, he married a woman called Jezebel who was from Sidonia. This was a Canaanite territory. And these are people that worshipped Baal prophet. But verse 33, that makes it even more conspicuous, and you wonder what was going on here. It says that, uh, and Ahab made an Asherah, Ahab, an Asherah, and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. And I wondered whether this Ahab was actually ordained by God. How can somebody go to an extent that he can do things to provoke God who had chosen him to lead the people of Israel? He did the worst to put God to anger by erecting altars for the Baal worship, putting up temples for the worship of Baal. And in life, we'll also get such people. 
we'll always have our hubs around us. People who will do their best to provoke us emotionally, either to anger or to sadness or to grieving. It can be a colleague at work, it can be a spouse, it can be a child. And you'll wonder why they are doing such things. And you'll hear people talking about the black sheep in the family or a thorn in the flesh. They are basically referring to those kinds of characters. There's also a mention of Jezebel. Jezebel was the wife of uh, King Ahab at that time, and she was a queen. She promoted Baal worship and funded the Asherah and uh, Baal prophets in the nation. Jezebel is also mentioned several times in the Bible as a demonic spirit with characteristics of deception, manipulation, instilling fear, pride, greed, selfishness, creating false arguments, and many more. In Revelation 20, chapter 2, verse 20, it talks about the self-proclaimed prophetess who was inciting or rather seducing the servants of God to commit sexual sins and also eat food that was offered to idols. So going back to chapter 19 of First Kings, it begins by Ahab passing some information in the evening to Jezebel. And uh, Jezebel being furious, she sends a message to Elijah and tells him, let the God strike me. If by this time tomorrow, I'll not have done to you what you have done to them. But the interesting thing that I find disturbing is that uh, during this contest, the story that Je uh, Ahab was telling uh, Jezebel was that uh, there was a contest in Mount Carmel and uh, Elijah had killed all the prophets of Baal. But it's interesting that Jezebel was the founder and there was a leader. Where was she when the memo was passed to the whole Israelite so that they can attend the contest? And I came to realize that uh, probably she just deliberately decided to hide from that contest, knowing what the outcome was going to be. But interestingly, her reaction is also kind of uh, intelligent. Actually, Jezebel's spirit is uh, also very intelligent. So she knows that she's been defeated, but she still goes ahead and sends a message. This time tomorrow, you will be dead. Yet she knows that Elijah has the backing of the whole Israel. So she cannot actually literally attack this person. But she's now using her intelligence to intimidate Elijah. In boxing, those who are familiar with sports like boxing and uh, wrestling, there's something that is called trash talking. Before the guys that are going to meet each other in the ring meet a day before, they'll meet and they exchange words. The purpose of this is to intimidate your opponent. So you speak words that are belittling. You can tell them like, ah, you'll regret meeting me in the ring tomorrow. I wish you withdraw from this fight. And that can be intimidating to an opponent if he's not psychologically prepared. So this is what Jezebel does to Elijah. He sends this message just to see his reaction. Elijah, by tomorrow, if you will not be dead, then may the gods kill me. And this throws Elijah off balance, and he flees. He flees from his home. And I'm wondering, the same Elijah who was very courageous, very bold, talking and taunting the prophets of Baal during the contest, is now all of a sudden intimidated and shaken to his inner core. And Elijah decides to flee from home. 
into the wilderness. He first travels to a place called Beersheba from Jezreel, that is around 150 kilometers, and leaves his servant there and uh, moves again forward, another journey of a day, and rests under a broom tree, feeling very, very exhausted. And it brings me back to even the way we relate with each other, the way we relate with one another at work, in business, how we allow that spirit of Jezebel to manipulate us. It can be apparent using the words, allowing the spirit of Jezebel to manifest in him and in his words. And you'll hear a parent telling his child, like after paying all these school fees, surely, you've brought just an E or a D, and those words can break a child. But the interesting thing is that it's not just education alone that will give this child his breakthrough in life. We want to find out that. What about his relationship with God? Is he a God-fearing person? Have we really identified the talent and the gifting of this child? And you can hear some words from even a spouse, a husband or a wife, telling his partner, if you can't get a job, I think you are becoming a liability to the family. Those words break people's hearts and they can even break a marriage that was solid. And those are the manipulations of the spirit of Jezebel. She is very crafty with words and very smart. And she looks for loopholes and utilizes them. And many times they'll attack when we are at our highest emotions. It could be an emotion to do with anger, an emotion to do with sadness. And even when you are overjoyed, that is when Jezebel can also pounce on you and do a lot of harm to you. In Elijah's case, I believe he was much excited that he would go to go back to God and strengthen himself spiritually and put his guard off. In the Bible, we are reminded in Romans chapter 8, from verse 26 to 29, that the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, if we don't know what God wants us to pray for, like in Elijah's case, who instead decided to say, God, take my life. The Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Those who are familiar with aviation or have even watched documentaries to do with the aviation, you have heard uh, the word May Day. May Day is normally a distress call that uh, is normally sent by the people in the aircraft when they experience challenges and they feel like uh, their safety is compromised. So they'll send this signal to the people in the control tower so that somebody somewhere can be able to assist them. And as I looked at that word, what came to my mind is that uh, even in our spiritual life, there are times that our soul will connect with our spirit and our spirit will connect with God's spirit and it will send the mayday signal to God's control tower that is the Holy Spirit. For intervention. And this is what I see as Elijah is now breaking down his physically, mentally, and emotionally, dying, his spirit on his behalf, on his behalf, sends communication to God's spirit. And at that moment, God quickly dispatches an angel to go and intervene in Elijah's case. And the angel goes there and begs a bread for him, and he wakes him up and says, eat the bread. 
And Elijah wakes up and eats the bread and goes back to sleep. And again, the angel comes back and says, wake up and eat the bread. For the journey ahead of you is long. The bread that the angel had baked here was not just the normal loaf that we know of, but this was spiritual bread. It was divine. This is the same bread that Jesus talks about. I am the bread of life. If you eat from me, you will not go hungry or you will not thirst. So this is the superior bread that God provided to our brother Elijah in his lowest moment. So it is important to understand that angels are heavenly beings under God's command and authority. In Psalms 103, verse 20 says, Praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty ones who carry out his plans, listening for each of his commands. The roles of angels can be to protect us, to care for us, to carry God's messages, and even to attend to his servants the way the angel here attended to Elijah. And also we remember that in Matthew chapter 4, verse 11, the angel will come and attend to Jesus after the devil had tempted him in the desert. But nevertheless, we don't worship angels, we don't pray to them, and we don't give them instructions. So the question is, how do we relate with these heavenly beings? If you don't pray to them, if you don't worship them, if you don't give them instructions. In Romans chapter 8 verse 14 says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. The moment we become co-heirs with Christ, then we receive the same privileges that Christ has and receives from God the Father. So when the Spirit of God comes and abides in us, then in those times when we are low, the Spirit of God, like, God, like we mentioned in verse 26 onwards, comes and intercedes on our behalf in groaning and intercession. And that Spirit is the one that will give now instructions now to these heavenly beings because we are now one. We are now one in the Holy Spirit. And I'll give an analogy of uh, the relationship between the superpower nations and the third world countries. For instance, if a leader, let's say the president of America, visits Kenya, his security team and the Kenyan team security will collaborate but there are instances when they feel like the third world country cannot handle the security issues. The superpower will talk, take over the whole security of that nation. They will be in charge. And it's the same way the Holy Spirit also works with us. There are responsibilities that he will allow us to take on our own. But when he realizes that we are overwhelmed and we cannot handle those matters, then he now takes over and runs the show. And that's why now he's able now to bring in now the divine spiritual beings in heaven. And they are able to provide for us, they are able to protect us, they are able to deliver messages and even other things that may be necessary for us to continue moving forward. There's a question that... Uh, God asked Elijah after he had been ministered to by the angel, after he had woken up, eaten, and been strengthened, the Lord asked him, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah told him that I'm the only one left. Everybody around me is dead. All the other prophets have been killed. 
I'm the only one left. He moves on towards Sinai and the Lord shows him different miracles. There's an earthquake and there's fire. And then eventually God comes and asks the same question. Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah gives the same response. I am the only one left. All the other prophets are gone. Actually, this was a rhetorical question. It was not a question that required Elijah to say that he's the only one left. But rather God was pointing out to who he is, his power and authority and capability. That was the purpose of these miracles, feeding him supernaturally. Supernaturally through Elijah. Elijah, have you understood that I can still feed you even when you have nobody to take care of you? Your servant is behind now, left back in Beersheba, but I'm still feeding you. Elijah, what are you doing here? I'm the only one left. And this is the same feeling that sometimes in our daily activities and uh, endeavors, we get to that point where we doubt whether God is still with us, whether we are the only believers that are still surviving in this world. And many times, this is induced by the spirit of Jezebel. You are the only Christian that is now walking in righteousness. All your colleagues are going for the lunch hour or evening coffee, illicit affairs. Why should you attend lunch hour prayers? Why can't you join them? And it even moves into families. You'll hear parents saying, I I can't pray for them anymore. That is discouragement from the spirit of Jezebel. We are required to consistently keep on praying and keep on praying until we get our breakthroughs. And whether it's a relationship between spouses, probably you have a discussion with your spouse and you have agreed that moving forward they are now going to change. They will no longer do the same things they will, they've been doing that keep on hurting you. Then all of a sudden you see some things that uh, look like the same, same things that they have been doing. And you conclude that, I, this one cannot change. I'm alone actually in this. I should not keep on with this relationship. That is a deception from the spirit of Jezebel. She's always there to convince you that give up, let go. You will never win against me. But the interesting thing, Jezebel knows that she has already been defeated. There's an, an, an encounter that is mentioned in the book of Kings, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17. This happens when Elisha now, the success of Elijah, was surrounded by his enemies. And his servant was greatly terrified. And he was wondering, how will our fate be? So Elijah, Elisha prays in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17, and says, Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And that is my prayer. You may be feeling dejected like Elijah and you are feeling like I'm the only one left in this journey. I'm praying that the Lord will open your eyes that you may see the chariots and his army that are surrounding you and that you may come to awareness that actually you are not alone. God is fighting for you and he has your back covered. You only need to trust him. God is only expecting trust from you. And let him carry that load. And as I come to conclusion, 
one of the encouragements that uh, I find in Scripture is in Second uh, Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. And it says that, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but I've given you the spirit of power and sound mind. The moment you deliberately decide to guard your mind from the manipulation of the spirit of Jezebel, then you are now able to overcome the challenges that the enemy is going to use to manipulate you and to bring you down and to defeat you and to stop you from conquering your territory. I'm encouraging you to go back to the discipline of your consistent Bible study. Go back to your personal and family devotion. Go back to your daily prayer. Go back to your fellowship. Those Bible studies, that is where you'll meet those servants who haven't bowed down to Baal. God says that there are 7,000 more prophets that haven't worshipped Baal, and you'll only get them in the house of the Lord, not in the secular world, not in Tamasha and those other places that people will entice you with. He's saying go back. There are three people that he put along the way, and it was just amazing that there's the king of Aram, and he says that, go back. I've anointed that guy. He'll bring down all those people that are against you. But in case they pass him, they'll meet Jehu, and Jehu will slay them. But in case they're not finished by Jehu, Elisha is going to finish them. These are three people that God has set to do his business, to deal with these people that were opposing Elijah. But the most encouraging one that he has a reserve, 7,000. Those ones are pending. Those are pending. But he's assuring you that only the three are able to finish the job. But in case there's a problem, there's 7,000 more in the reserve. I want to read Second Corinthians. Chapter 10, verse 3 to 5, as I finish and uh, invite my brother Evans to come and lead us in prayer. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 says, It is true that we live in the world, but we do not... Tr but it is true that we live in the world, but we do not fight from worldly motives. The weapons we use in our fight are not the world's weapons, but God's powerful weapons, which we use to destroy strongholds. We destroy false arguments. We pull down every proud obstacle that is raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive and make it obey Christ. Let's appreciate him more. Wow, 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 wow. That was a powerful exposition. And we thank God for that. Uh, we have learned many things. The spirit of Jezebel. We have learned about the bread of life, which is the word of God. And, uh, and this is a call for us to bounce back. Bouncing back, that thing that you are doing and the enemy distracted you. Maybe you stopped praying, you stopped believing God in that career. Maybe it's that business that is already dead. But we have been encouraged that it can bounce back. So I just want us to bow down and just respond to the word of God. You know that uh, part of your life that you feel is down and you are trusting God that it can bounce back. Let's just go before the Lord 
and respond to this word. Let's just trust in this God. Let's believe in him again because he is able. Our Father, we worship you. We exalt you and we thank you even for speaking to us, O oh God, through your servant, Brian, O oh my Father. And Lord, you have spoken to us about bouncing back to take new territories, O oh God. And Lord, we believe in you that even in that career, O oh God, that it is bouncing back. That business that is dead, Lord, it is bouncing back. We are trusting in you, O oh Lord. Even that marriage, O oh God, that seems to be nowhere, that seems to, be, to have ended, Lord, that you are bringing it back, O oh my Father. That you are reviving us, O oh King of glory. That you are restoring even the place of Bible study in our lives. That place of family devotion, O oh God. We are trusting in you, Jehovah God, that you, we will bounce back, O oh God. That plans that we, we had when we started the year, O oh God, and we seem to be not doing good, not doing well, Lord. We are tr still trusting in you, Lord. We are hoping in you, King of glory. We put our faith in you, and we know that, Lord, that will bounce back, O oh Lord. That marriage will bounce back, oh my father. That child who has gone away will come back, oh my father. Lord, we bless you. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we exalt you because you've done it, oh God. We thank you, Jehovah God. Each one of us is blessed, oh my father. Every one of us, oh God, is blessed. That business is blessed. That marriage is blessed, oh God. Oh, Lord, we thank you and we bless you, Jehovah, because of what you are doing in our lives, because that of that renewal, that revival. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Let's appreciate the Lord again. Amen. The Lord has been good and he has spoken to us in a mighty way. Let's just give a hand clap of praise to him again. Amen, amen, amen.